in looking at the um, the rental market, it's interesting in a way. You're looking at the you're looking at the back end of that phenomenon that I talked about this morning. This morning, how many of you were here this morning when we talked about the working with buyers? Okay. Well, for those of you who weren't, I'm, I'm not really going to repeat what we went through this morning. It's, it's somewhat detailed, and you know. But for those of you who were here, what do you think? Does does any of that comport with what you're seeing, or what you understand? Does it is it merge with your experience at at, at any level? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, almost everywhere, and I'm not just divining this stuff. I get it from what I read and hear from realtors. Well, what I'm reading and hearing when it comes to property management is also very interesting and guys it is market driven. And I don't mean market driven in the sense of what is your vacancy rate and is anybody building a new apartment building nearby that's going to appeal to the same tenants that you would like to appeal to. That's not my point. I'm, I'm talking about macro issues here. Now those macro issues we talked about this morning I think we are going to apply in the Hampton Roads area perfectly. There's nothing uh, sufficiently unique about the Hampton Roads area that it will be immune from the general trends uh, that we have seen uh, nationwide. Northern Virginia will be a little bit different because of its A, slightly more affluent population, B, um, a little bit more stable than the more transient population of the Hampton Roads area because of the military presence here. Although you have that counterbalance of the every four years, people coming and going in Washington or every two years, you know, with Congress and so on. You have a big turnover there, but Richmond, very similar to Hampton Roads. I think you're going to see these trends. Virginia is pretty much a bellwether. In the, in the, the rental market, um, Let's identify the things that directly affect the, the macro picture for you. What are they? Well, <laughs> what is the demand that you've got for rental housing? Have you ever seen it higher? I can't ever, I can't ever remember that it has been higher. Um, and of course we know why. It's been, it's been pretty brisk for the simple reason that we have had millions of people lose their houses in the foreclosure, uh, the foreclosures that occurred from 2007 through 2010. And that to a certain degree have continued. Millions. We've also had another phenomenon that is ongoing. The aging of the housing stock. You know, we tend to forget that houses do wear out. <laughs> and the number that have to be replaced each year is substantial millions fall out of use each year and have to be replaced. We have been building millions of houses lately. You know, the, uh, when this morning we were talking about at the peak we had, what, four to five million houses, new houses being built at the, uh, at the bottom of the slump, 350,000 or so. 350,000 is far less than the number of houses that are taken out of existence every year due to old age or demolition or making way for, uh, for commercial development or things of that sort, okay? Far fewer. So what we've actually had happen the last few years is a double whammy. More demand and a diminished supply due to the housing of the, uh, the aging of the housing stock that is not being replaced by new construction. What is replacing or what is furnishing the uh, supply for rental houses? Well, it hasn't been construction of multifamily until relatively recently. There's been very little of that. Although the brisk demand of 8, 9, and 10 did see a burst of uh, multifamily housing construction uh, mid-10 through this time. And we've seen a little burst of that construction. In fact, it's taking up most of the construction that is being done in the housing market is multifamily. But where does most of this come from? Where does most of the demand, uh, how is it met? Well, the people that lost their houses in the foreclosure, the houses didn't just disappear. They are put back into circulation, many of them, if not most of them, as single family rental units. So in a way, what we have is 
a shift of the ownership person out of this house into a similar house um, as a, a landlord, as a tenant, as opposed to a landlord, uh, as opposed to an owner. In fact, it got to be that many of the commentators looking at the rental market made that exact point. They said these people are just tenants who got there ahead of time. They are owners only in the legal sense. They have long since stopped paying their mortgage. They're about to lose the house and they're going to move into a similar house or one a little bit less expensive that has been purchased by somebody who grabs up the distressed property, puts a little bit of money in it, and puts it on the rental market to meet the uh, steadily increasing demand for rental properties. You know, the, um, uh, as, I, so as I say, you know, the, the story about um, the, uh, the new construction uh, being met primarily by multifamily, um, that multifamily construction, as we say, together with single family construction is considerably less than is necessary to replace the aging and disappearing housing stock. You put it all together, lots of people wanting the housing. Every person who lost a house, you have a new tenant to be. But you have the aging and disappearing housing market that is not being replaced by new construction because of the economic conditions. You therefore have a shortage. And that is a supply and demand issue. There's just no way around it. That shortage has boosted rents, lowered occupancies, and even convinced some people to get into the market and begin to develop new uh, multifamily housing. So I'd like to ask you, what is the new family or the multifamily market like down here in terms of new construction? Are you seeing much, if any? <coughs> you are seeing a fair amount? You say a lot. Historically a lot or a lot in relation to the last couple of years? Four or five brand new buildings are finished and they're right. down. I mean, yeah. They're going to overbuild. Yeah. Oh, they're going to overbuild. <laughs> huh? Yeah. 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 A comment here for. Is anybody in the other rooms now, by the way? Okay, good. So. Yeah, there's no. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, even with the brisk demand, likely to be. A little bit. All right, now let me ask you this. What are your vacancy rates in apartments in generally? I mean, compared to where they are in a typical market. Correct me if I'm wrong, in a relatively stable market, your occupancy rates are anywhere from 92% up. They seldom get much above 93 or 4%, do they? Your occupancy rates. Landlords actually don't want 100% occupancy. Um, they have problems rotating people the way they need to or accommodating people that need to come in. If they're at much above 90%, especially as they approach 95, they need to build a new unit. I mean, they really, believe it or not, that's the way it is. Which is why 7-Eleven doesn't let their, bu their businesses get too busy. Did you know that? It's fascinating market retail. And housing, rental is, is just another form of retail, if you think about it. Um, McDonald's, 7-Eleven, Burger King, name a franchise. Why do you see them every other corner? Yes and no. But there's a reason that you see them every so often. They will not allow any store to have sales beyond a certain amount. Because if they do, they are begging for their competitor to come in next door. So what they do is preempt and drain off excess sales out of this place. Keep the lines down, keep service high. They, they beat their opponents, if they can, by getting in down here. So if a store is doing too much business, you can expect that franchise to open another store nearby. Now, um, occasionally, that's the thinking, and that is very much the thinking in the commercial uh, rental market. And here, this is a commercial. What's being leased is a residence, but the people doing the leasing are in commerce in the way we understand it. They're in the residential, commercial residential business, you know what I mean? Um, so I'm not really surprised to see that there's new construction going on because occupancy rates demand it. 
Question is, where can we expect occupancy rates to be in a year, two years, five years? And that's a, an issue that we started digging out a little bit this morning, but let's look a little further. We didn't really get to the, the, the rental side of this. But what were the themes of the morning on the market? Yeah, there is a, a, at least temporarily, we have an inventory shortage that's manifesting itself by fairly nice increases in prices, a lot of activity in that unrestricted band of properties, multiple offers and accelerating prices and shrinking inventory, right? It's being bought up pretty quick. On the non-distressed properties. On non-distressed yeah. properties. Yeah. Right, and so those are some of the signs we're seeing. But as we saw today, there's this other great big huge envelope of properties that have been locked off the market that whose failure or the lack of which properties in the competitive market is driving these prices up uh, or keeping them high because of the shortage of these properties. Um, and some of the trends that we saw are that we can expect due to a lot of factors, the settlement of the big robo-signing suit, Fannie and Freddie adopting new rules regarding short sales, the settlement of that suit adopting new procedures and protocols on the parts of banks in the way they deal with people who are delinquent or people who want to sell but owe more than their, uh, they get for their house. That all of these things are going to see over, a f they've already begun and we're going to see the, the, uh, the shift continue to stress helping people who can afford it and want to, to stay in houses where they're underwater. But primarily the focus is, let's get people who cannot afford it or don't want to stay a relatively easy way out of houses where they owe more than they are going to get. And let's avoid foreclosures to the extent we can and move as many of those into the short sale arena as we can. That does a lot of things that are going to affect that curve that we looked at this morning. And one of the things is it's going to increase demand of undistressed property. And by that I mean physically distressed. The abandoned property that is vandalized or the foreclosure house that suffers the foreclosure property, uh, party and uh, goes to the lender in pretty bad shape. So a lot of things are, are moving in the direction. So what is the, what is the consequence of that on the rental market. We didn't talk about that this morning. We talked about its consequence on the market, the resale market. It's going to moderate prices, increase demand, I mean increase supply, but also as uh, we see people, if the economy does pick up or if they look uh, at the possibility of a foreclosure, that property will move increasingly into the short sale arena and provide what? an option for people who are having to chase prices higher in the existing undistressed market. Okay, So I think it's going to absorb some of those buyers who are now paying more than they will in a year with a bigger supply of, of housing. But what about the rental side? The rental side is more interesting now than it was a year ago <laughs> uh, before the settlement. I think you're going to have, relative to what we have faced, a gradual decline in the number of foreclosures. Now see that was the other side of the coin we talked about this morning. We're going to see more short sales. I think that's going to be with a relative slackening of the increase or the number of foreclosures. It is not going to be any time soon that we see a, a real decline in foreclosures. Why? Because we have millions of them still in inventory. But as the move to push them into short sale as opposed to foreclosure or keep them in the house through various programs uh, that lenders will now be contributing more to than they were because of the settlement, you may see a, a reduction in the pace. They will be historically high for years to come, but they will be uh, nothing quite like we have seen to date. There will be more than we saw the last year and a half because there was a, a real cessation during the robo-suit. Lenders really short, you know. And every time I'd read something a year, a year ago, I'd read something about foreclosures drop again. I'd say, well, duh. <laughs> well, lenders are afraid to foreclose on anything anymore. They can't. They're getting their brain suit out. But that will end. <laughs> and it has. 
So for a while we're going to see a pickup. They're going to be judicious about it. It'll be more orderly. And I think it's more likely to trend toward equilibrium. Um, long and the short of it, I think your market has probably flattened a bit. I doubt that you're going to see, and because also occupants have be, occupancies have been high enough that they trigger that automatic next building, like the busy McDonald's triggers the automatic next McDonald's. Uh, we're going to see a, a little bit of the pressure on rents abate, and that'll, I hope, be good news for, for tenants anyway, if not for landlords. But occupancies will stay fairly high. For every person who loses a house, there's another tenant. It's just that we're likely to see a little bit more of a replacement to moderate the, the supply side further. I was just um, thinking that with all these um, multifamily buildings going up, more and more single family homes are becoming rental properties. Oh, yeah, sure. And so they're kind of jumping ahead of themselves because a lot of people might want to prefer to live in a single family yeah. home, rent a single family Difficult to say. Uh, one of the things is it's hard for me to figure out, but here are some thoughts. Um, we not only have a naturally aging housing supply, everybody does. No house lasts forever. So we have hundreds of thousands, if not a few million, that, that disappear every year. But our population is also growing. We're not just seeing housing supply not replaced by new construction. The diminished supply is not replaced, but we're also seeing more people come into the country either through immigration or birth. And think of the time now that it's been that people have not been buying houses. They've been living in their parents' house, their boomerang kids, or they've been in college and they decided to stay in college because that avoids having to, you know, extends the sabbatical from the serious issues of life, right? As a friend of mine used to call college. <laughs> my four-year sabbatical from the serious issues of life. <laughs> and, and for him, that was exactly what it was. But people, and, and have you been reading about the effect that it's having on the birth rates? Almost dramatically, the, the birth rates have plummeted, almost to European levels. Um, I think that's temporary, but it's pretty alarming. The um, People are delaying, if they're living at home or sharing an apartment with two or three other people and you can't move up in a job or get a job, then you're not going to be moving out on your own, getting married, having kids. I mean, these are things that you delay. Um, and you know, the European birth rates have hit the point of collapse, utter collapse, no question. It's a, it's a story that isn't being enough told. Uh, Italy, France, well, almost all of Europe. Japan is way beyond it. They've all reached the point from which no, no ethnic demographic has ever recovered in terms of the replacement rate. 2.1 births per woman is the replacement rate. Two, obviously, one for you and one for the, the father. 0.1 because not every kid makes it to adulthood. European rates are 1.3, 1.4, 1 1.6. Nobody in Europe is at 2.1. Um, Russia is so low that they say that in essence it will lose 50 million people by the middle of the, of the century. But um, the US has always been around 2.1, 2.2 for many years, but we've been steadily increasing in terms of population because of brisk immigration, legal and illegal. Uh, but lots of legal immigration as well. We've always been you know, kind of a magnet. Uh, but now some of the things I read that in uh, the young demographics, the, the, uh, the replacement rate is now 1.5, 1.4, 1.6 in different demographics. Very low. Very, very worrisome if it, if it doesn't turn around. Um, well, our population is growing. Notwithstanding this, what I hope is temporary, temporary uh, reduction. Um, so, what is likely to happen with rental rates and so on. I think they're likely to stabilize. You've observed that there seem to be more multi, uh, multifamily units going up or projects going up than seems to be warranted. <coughs> but I'll tell you, I don't think that's a, a, an accident. They may overshoot, no question about it, but it is not an accident that when you get to 95% occupancy, you are missing dollars 
if you are not <coughs> making more units available for sale, for, for rent. And the housing stock is not being replaced. And there's pent-up demand with people who can't move out of the house, who would love to move out of the house if the economy revives. So I think that's what they're anticipating. We'll see how accurate they are. But you know what they all add up to to me? Stabilizing. More things coming on the market and slower foreclosures. So, we'll see. You. But what about in maybe two to five years when the people who had to leave their foreclosures and short sales and are kind of tanked and they went to rent and then uh, their credit gets better in this time frame and the economy gets better, aren't they all going to leave all of the rentals and make more of that available because they're going to want to go back and buy? Yeah, and who will pick up those rentals that they leave available? Right. First time home buyers who can afford to buy a relatively expensive small house, which has been out of their reach now for a decade. If you think about it, since this time last decade, home prices had burst out of the range of affordability. And then they burst back through the point where people, and the, or, or with the economy, they, the reverse happened. They were more and more affordable, but people couldn't get a loan or afford to buy or lost a job or whatever. So we've had a decade where people have, first time home buyers have really been getting it in the air. No question about it. Um, and you're also going to have people who are gradually repairing their credit. You know, that, that, this is a healing process in many ways. You know, in the last, last uh, part of the program I was talking about a healing process that has to begin, um, or in, in the morning I was talking about that, and in urging people to be more receptive to the whole idea of distressed properties as filling a void that we now see in our market and it's screaming at us. Declining inventory and increasing prices scream when there's a huge block of property that is sitting there unsold but the sellers would love to be able to move or sell. You know, so part of the process is assisting in getting that done. Part of the process here is assisting in getting buyers who have been shut out, especially first time home buyers, young buyers, who have been shut out of this market for a decade back into that market. And what will that do as well? It will facilitate as people repair their credit, rent for a few years. It doesn't take all that long to repair your credit. I mean, it seems like forever if it's you, but really in the grand scheme of things, a few years and you begin to get to the point where you can consider buying a house again. Um, and your house is the perfect house for somebody, or the house you're renting, the perfect house for somebody to move into as a first home. And, uh, you know. So frankly, I've t I think we've turned a little bit of a corner in the rental market, as well as we have a new construction, and we're facing a new paradigm in the resale market. And that has not turned yet. It's, it's going to turn, but it has not yet. That is to come getting tired to hear about markets. I mean, they're actually, for our business, I hope that understanding what is going on in these ways kind of helps you understand where you can take your business and look for business and help people guide their actions. But in your market, I think you're seeing in the, in the, um, in the property management area, in the rental market, you're seeing an area of stability now, I think, that's a little bit, ought to be a little bit comforting to you after the rather frenetic period that you've had the last few years. Or maybe you like always being short units to rent. But I don't think that's particularly good. One thing about high occupancy is you have fewer leases. You have less space to lease. I know the property managers at the uh, real estate investment trust I worked for for years, Highwoods up in, in, Shaw, in uh, Richmond, you know, the Innsbruck office park, you know, class A office space. They hate it when they get real, really high rates of occupancy. They don't have anything to lease. They really don't have any People that need something can't find it. There's too little selection. And they often miss it. They miss the opportunity to, to they don't have enough inventory. Um, anybody here that feels that way? Are you just happy having all your inventory leased up and that's good enough? <laughs> I'll tell you what, you're better off with slightly lower rents and more space that you can turn over. Not just in your wallet, but your landlord is better off there too.
not from the landlord's standpoint. The landlords are missing dollars if they have too high an occupancy. Isn't that, isn't that odd? Well, of course they do, but my point is that if you're in the multifamily, now I'm not talking about the people that own a house. Well, that's what I'm saying. We're talking okay. Some of us do just residential property. Most of us do. But let me tell you, let me, let's even look at that. How many of you represent investors who have bought several foreclosures? Mm -hmm. How many of you represent investors that have at least a half a dozen, five to ten residential single family? I'm telling you guys, you may, not, you may not think this, but if you've got somebody that's got five or six multifamily and they are constantly full, he's buying another one. He ought to be. He ought to be. And, and I tell you, I, you know, this is just, but experience says, if I've got five things that are making me money, I ought to have a sixth. It's when my last unit gets me to that equilibrium point that I don't make more money on the next one, that I stop. But when my next one is going to make me more money, I'm crazy not to buy it. And maybe you don't have the money to do it, but most of the people could do it off the income they're making on these. And they get to that equilibrium point. They spend a little money, fix it up, and wait till they can enter that upper tier, or are ready to, sell it for the profit that they have created by buying it cheap, fixing it up, and looking at a market of shortage. Now you may not think that way. Uh, you, this may not be, and there's no reason that you would think this way, because you're not the advisors to these people. But they think this way. Single family residences are a business to these people. And um, I don't know, you may get the oddball who says, hey, I'm just happy with what I got, I ain't going any further. But that's not the typical person who sees an opportunity with the next unit. We have a lot of people we sold houses to the military and left the area and could not sell it and all they want to do is get somebody to make them more expensive. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're not investors. They're just private owners. Yeah, that's a different that's a difference. And I think that that's probably and I could be wrong, yeah. I think that's the majority of the people here in the room. Yes. Yeah. Are the ones that are managing those homes that So you're managing but it's not people who want to be in the inve in the investment business. They're they're rank because they have to. So the last thing they want is another one of these. And the tenants, majority of the tenants would like to buy, but the credit won't allow them. Well, but the the point I'm making though, the bigger point is that you you are still not immune from the effects of the multifamily market and the investors who have been buying up these uh, foreclosed properties. They are a huge part of your market, and they have <coughs> they have an impact on what's going to happen to your rental rates and occupancy rates, and that's irrespective of any individual seller that you've got. Now, you probably have uh, I expect you do have a higher incidence of that because of the prevalence of military people who get moved around and they've got to get rid of their house and they're underwater. And the last thing they need, especially if they've got a security clearance, is any ding on their credit. They cannot take anything on their credit. You know the the the, the insanity of the way foreclosures and, and short sales worked uh, short sales worked in the first year or two was remember lenders would say um, miss you got to miss some mortgage payments yeah. 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 you got to miss mortgage payments and I had a listing agent down here called you know I, I grew up down here and I had a listing I, you know everybody I knew was in the Navy I mean all, all the kids that I hung out with their dads worked at Little Creek or their mom was employed over at, uh, you know, down at Oceana or something like that. Well, um, you know, in this area where you've got that kind of turnover, um, you're going to have more people that just don't have the choice. But remember what they said. This guy called me and he said, my client is in the military. He's being told, he's been transferred, he's being told he can't be approved for a short sale if he hasn't missed two months of his mortgage. But as soon as he does, his credit is damaged, he loses his security clearance. He'll, he won't be able to, to keep his security clearance. That, that program, there is a Cuckoo. program now that, that, that's, that's recognizing that and is allowing military members to... But for two and a half years, it was, it was a complete bind that these people were placed in. And, and you know what? It makes you realize that 
the repair and the relatively positive steps we are seeing now from the spring right on through November when Fannie and Freddie come on board with the new foreclosure uh, short sale protocols. How long it has taken is what's remarkable. There's nothing terribly complicated about what has to be done, is there? Streamline it, make it easy, unlock this capital, human and financial. That's, well, that's because they hired people who didn't know anything about real estate. Well, under, to us like they were stupid. Well, no, that, you're right. They, the people that were hired, they were understaffed, overworked, didn't know what they were doing, and the lenders um, were completely upside down on their policies, completely upside down, because they looked at, um, and, and you can sort of appreciate it initially, their capital had been demolished, had been wiped out. In the crash, bank capital disappeared, and they were on the brink of of insolvency, bankruptcy. They were out of money. Uh, you know, TARP and all those things kind of infused it again, but it took them years to repay that. Um, many of the banks are still repaying it. Huh? It's an election. Well, this didn't happen though. The, the banks turning the corner on this was, um, I think, out of necessity as much as anything. Fannie and Freddie, I know, are doing it because uh, the conservator who's been appointed there is, one, is a sharp guy. Very sharp, he understands. It's about time, like the guy that they put in place of uh, the Resolution Trust back in 1990. He said, we're getting this property off the books. FDIC and F FSLIC had taken million, countless billions of dollars of property in insuring these F SNLs and their mortgage liens. You know, they, they inherited the mess and they had foreclosed on gazillions of these things and they had all this worthless property. And they said, one year. It's off our books in one year. One year later, the economy, which had tanked, had, uh, grew by 3.5%. <coughs> one year later, and you know, this guy, I think, has is, is finally decided Fannie and Freddie are going to get this junk off their books as quickly as possible. It ain't going to happen in a year. But it's already been five or six, and, and virtually no progress has been made. So any progress is good. Yeah, the question, do I, do I see investors coming into the, multifam uh, the single family market in the near future? Yeah. Yeah, uh, financing is an issue, but yeah, there's going to be such a relatively steady flow of foreclosure properties. Um, not like we've seen, but there is a big backlog, almost two years of relatively sluggish foreclosure activity has built up a huge amount of people delinquent. They are not all going to be able to, to be handled by these um, TARP programs, and I mean uh, uh, HAMP and programs like that and mortgage relief and restructuring of mortgage loans. They're too far under, too far gone on their, you know, some of them haven't paid a mortgage in two years. And many of those are going to be coming on the market as banks clean them up, but they can't do it all at once or they would depress values too much. So I think you're going to see it for a good time to come. That's why I, I think the stars for you are aligning toward relative stability. The stars in the resale market are aligning toward increased inventory, uh, a, 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 a change over time in the brisk increase in prices that we've seen. It won't be right away, but I think we are going to see that. It's not going to be continuing to match Is there some to match of regulation this. that says how many, like, how many each bank can release at a certain amount of time to keep the market from going? Well, they have capital requirements, and they have, but Actually, the, regula the regulatory question is what kind of regulations affect banks in the way they sell REO. Actually, what banks can own is far more onerous on them than what they can sell. They have pretty strict limits on what they can own. After, under federal regulations, after a bank acquires a certain amount of real estate, it no longer qualifies as a lending institution under the rules. It becomes a bank, it becomes a real estate holding company. It's a percentage of your it's a percentage of your assets that are in non-financial instruments. Okay, so it's got to do with number of the property. It's, it's no, no, it's, it's it's the percentage of the assets that you hold of a non-financial nature or of a real estate nature. <coughs> that was the problem in the crash. Banks could not get rid of REO fast enough because the, every time they reached their limits and they'd take in a piece, they had to get a piece out like a straw with a, filled with marbles, and you put one in, one's popping out. And so they were flooding the market with REO until you know, they finally slowed down on taking REO 
and to, to get things in order. But they had to rebuild their capital stock. They were, they were completely wiped out of money, and their capital requirements became too severe. They had to, get, they had to dump their REO, and they were taking it in too fast. I think you are going to see investors in this market, but I don't think you're going to see um, the same level of opportunities that you saw a year or two years ago. Where, uh, or especially two years ago. This time two years ago, the foreclosure market was very brisk. There had been a bit of a lull in the spring of 2010, but in the fall of 2010, things were really cranking. And then the, the, uh, the mess hit in October or November of 2010. I don't think you're likely to see that level again. And investors who bought in 9 and 10 were, were doing pretty well. They've done well in that regard. They've had very high demand for their product as rental property, and now they'll be selling into at least a temporarily accelerating market. Pretty good investments. Um, I think that accelerating market is likely to moderate a little bit for reasons we talked about. And I think the supply of these houses coming onto the market will be steady. Um, and so that'll moderate rental prices and you know, slake a little, uh, you know, diminish a little bit the appetite of somebody to get rental property. Uh, makes sense? I mean, you know, I just, a lot of it is kind of reading the tea leaves, but macro trends are pretty clear here. Pretty clear. There's a hand back here. Yes. Answer to what the tenant's rights are or what the tenant exactly. could. Okay. They come to my class and learn all about it. <laughs> all right, let's skip ahead. <laughs> Roman 3. We'll come back to two briefly. All right. You are managing a single family rental. And bingo. Foreclosure. What are the rights of the tenant? Did we miss two? Or? We did. Yeah. But the question prompted me to jump ahead. I'm going back. What are the tenant's rights? How do they, how do they arise? Where are they embodied? In the lease? Landlord Tenant Act, the lease, these are all good. They're all incorrect, but they're all good. No, no. They're all. Close? Yeah, yeah. You're on the right page. So what are their what are their rights? Where do you find their rights? Or what what was the situation until two thousand nine? Why? Why did they get kicked out? By what? And why did it do that? Did foreclosure always terminate a lease? No. When did it not? If the lease was, if the lien was subordinate to the lease, it didn't, it didn't wipe the lien out. It didn't wipe the lease out. But how many people had mortgages behind leases? Nobody. Leases are always behind mortgages. All right. You know what happens during a foreclosure? If you have a first mortgage, you have the first, you have a second, you have a judgment lien, and you have a lease. These are all called encumbrances on the title. And the condo. And the tax man. 
Tax man kind of gets priorities here. All right, so let's forget the tax man. What about these guys? What about these guys? What happens? This is your order. Second is delinquent, seriously delinquent, and forecloses. What result? Everybody below him goes Right. How does he sell it if there's a first ahead of him? He Huh? He either has to pay off the first out of the proceeds or sell subject to the first. Right. And who's going to buy it subject to the first? Nobody. Well, let me give you this. House is worth, let's just assume, house is worth 300 the first is a hundred, the second is a hundred, and the second forecloses. You think somebody might buy it subject to a hundred thousand dollar mortgage? Sure. They may very well. The only question is, in this market, nobody is foreclosing seconds. Nobody. Because there's no equity even for the first. Why would you even dream of foreclosing the second? Judgment lien holders? Don't make me laugh. POAs and condos? Give me a break. They're by statute, they're behind any first that was on there at the time of the purchase. So, I mean, you know, the idea that these people, now the lease, what about the lease? Can you go back to the condo POA? Wasn't there some legislation that put them up a little closer to the Nope. Nope. It puts them behind, always behind any mortgage lien that came ahead of them. Oh, discuss the effects of a deed in lieu? Sure, sure. I bet for a foreclosure, if, if you foreclose this first, you have a $300,000 first, the house is worth two hundred. dollars You foreclose and somebody comes to the sale and offers $120,000 and the lender says, go pound sand, and he bids it in at $200,000. The lender now owns it. It's a piece of REO, $200,000. That's what the house is worth. He now has the joy of paying, on average, including the cost of the foreclosure, sixty grand between now and the time he finally unloads that dog because he's now got to pay taxes and insurance and maintenance and upkeep and repair the damage and then hire a realtor, hire a property manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sixty grand. But what that does is it wipes all of these encumbrances out because they are junior to this lien. The lease is a junior encumbrance. It gets wiped out. Now, what the lender might do is come to the, uh, to the, um, the tenant and say, hey, uh, just as soon have you stay. You, know, you actually sometimes see, especially in the commercial world, you see a provision in a lease that will say that the lender may consider this lease superior. I mean, the landlord may consider this lease superior to the lien of the deed or trust if it so desires. In other words, the foreclosing party may wish to dispose of this property with a valuable tenant and a and a very creditworthy tenant paying a very nice rent. Keep that lease in place, not extinguish it. Consider it to be or elevate it to sub superior status to the lien so it doesn't get wiped out. You see that all the time in commercial leases and in some residential leases um, in markets that, uh, like in New York City where you have rent control. You know, you have all kinds of issues up there that prompt different kinds of leases. But anyway, this lease is typically going to be wiped out. Well, that's okay. The, the bank doesn't want the tenant there anyway because it wants to get rid of this pretty quick. It's going to put it on the market. Um, who's it going to sell it to? Um, most of the people it's going to sell it to are going to want to fix it up and rent it themselves. They are not likely in these cases to want to take the tenant that somebody else has put in that property. It's one of the reasons that the lender or the purchaser will do what's called cash for keys. Why do they have to give you cash to get out if the lease has been wiped out by the foreclosure? Why aren't you out on your ear the minute the foreclosure takes place? <laughs> yeah, they don't want to make them mad. No. Why, why do they have to pay the tenant to get out early? Yeah, but why do they have to pay the tenant? Why don't they just kick the tenant out? The, the lien, I mean, the encumbrance of the lease has been, has been Foreclosed. It's been demolished by the foreclosure. But they have you for an attorney. Not why. <laughs> kind of you. Yeah. Why do you have to pay them? All right, then they can stay. Why can they stay if their lease has been extinguished? I heard it. What law? 
<laughs> the Federal Tenant Protection Act of 2009. It said, notwithstanding the fact that this lease was put on after the lien, not approved by the lien holder, it diminishes the right of the lien holder to get the property back and dispose of it as the lien holder wishes. This is the law. The tenant may stay in that property for the duration of the lease, as long as the tenant is current or in compliance with the terms of the lease. You've been paying your rent and continue to pay your rent. You may stay during the duration of the lease unless, what? The purchaser of the property at REO, the REO property, intends to occupy it as a principal dwelling. So if, if I show up on the, the courthouse steps and say, I'm bidding this property in and I get it at the courthouse steps and I plan to live in it, the tenant has to get out. But they always have at least 90 days. Who does the tenant pay? The rent is paid to the owner. 